So you can probably share the link to that. All right, welcome everybody. Officially welcome to our June Our Ladies Philly Lightning Talk event. This is one of my favorite events that we have every year with the opportunity for folks to come and present something exciting about how they use R. So the agenda for today is gonna to be some announcements right now, and then we'll launch right into our four talks. And as we mentioned, you can ask questions in the chat. So I'll be moderating. So after each presentation, I will ask questions as they come in the chat, or we can have people unmute themselves. And if you wanna ask a question anonymously, or if you just prefer to use Slido, you can head over to slido.com with the hashtag our ladies. The link is also in the chat and you can upvote each other's questions and all sorts of things using Slido. So welcome everybody. I wanna remind everyone about um, number one, our Our Ladies <coughs> Code of Conduct. So you can head over to ourladies.org slash code of conduct to read it. I believe it's also uh, shown to you when you join the meetup. And Our Ladies is a worldwide organization. We are the Philadelphia chapter and our goal is to promote gender diversity in the R community. One, a few of the ways you can get involved specifically with Our Ladies Philly is that we have a Slack workspace which you can join and we have all sorts of local chat happening there from you know job postings to helping each other with our projects to asking um, about local events uh, as well as discussing our, our local uh, meetups and things like our annual datathon. You can also subscribe to our YouTube channel and you can also volunteer. So we have a directory where you can sign up to volunteer to be a mentor or uh, speak at our events. We're planning right now the events for the rest of the year which segues well into upcoming things. So you can always find out about our upcoming events on meetup.com. Uh, and our next couple events, I will have a slide on next. Very excited about our Tidy Models Book Club, which is launching in, on July 14th. Also keep in mind that you can learn about other Our Ladies chapter meetups, um, which are all listed under the Our Ladies global account on meetup.com. Some uploading, um, upcoming conferences that you might be interested in, and some of these are still open uh, for submissions if you want to submit an abstract. Uh, Use our 2022 is all virtual, and that's happening uh, only in a couple of weeks in June. Uh, our studio conference is in person, and that's happening in July in Washington, D.C. Uh, our medicine is completely virtual, and that's happening in August. And I think that is still open for submissions as well. So with that, I want to um, pass it over to Chun actually to say a couple things about the Our Ladies book club that we're starting around tidy models. And we're looking for volunteers to help lead these events, which you can see the link um, to sign up there. But with that, Chun, do you want to say a couple words about uh, this initiative? Um, hi, everyone. This is Chun. Um, so um, we come up with this as a book club is trying to uh, promote the community learning together. Um, so the book that we nominated for this year is an uh, introduction to statistical learning. Now, so sometimes it's called the machine learning Bible or something. Uh, and um, there is a, a GitHub kind of tutorial um, uh, provided by, uh, um, how do you pronounce her name, Emil Havfeld. So, uh, there's a really good tutorials to Im implicate uh, the tidy models in the lab exercise from that book. Um, so um, I know that uh, that book actually had been discussed by the uh, R2 data science group, but for our uh, group, we want to focus on the tidy models application. Um, for this uh, book club, everyone is welcome to participate. Um, and uh, now we are looking for the volunteers to lead the book club and the each uh, for each chapter. Uh, so here's the link if everyone is interested, please submit. So what are the volunteers will do is um, the volunteers will um, give uh, like a 20 to 30 minutes uh, summary presentation on the the chapter that they are signed up for and uh, the presentation format can be either um, overview the whole chapter or apply the chapter content to a mini data project uh, or any other preferred format that you think of. Um, so it's quite flexible and uh, it will follow up with uh, like community driven Q&A. Uh, we don't want to put a too, pressure, too much pressure on the volunteers because it's um, um, you know a community 
driven learning experience. So um, we want to uh, everyone read a book chapter before they come to the book club, and then we discuss the end the, the meetup time. Um, so hope everyone will enjoy this first uh, book club and uh, our ladies. Thanks. And if people have questions like now that they want to ask about, um, feel free, I guess, to put it in the chat since uh, we're on here to talk about the upcoming events. Uh, okay, so with that, I'm gonna start to kick off the speakers. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. So uh, this is the order of presenters. We'll have Michelle, June, Jesse, and then Kelsey. So I will stop sharing so that um, Michelle, if you wanna start queuing up your slides and I can do an introduction. All right. So uh, Michelle is one of our great Our Ladies Philly volunteers who's helped us out with a couple events in the, in the past. Michelle is a graduate student in the Cognition and Neuroscience PhD program at Temple University. And I believe she will give a little bit more of an introduction into herself and how she uses R. Uh, so with that, uh, go ahead, Michelle, take it away. Thank you, Alice. Um, so hi, everyone, like Alice said, I'm Michelle, I'm a PhD candidate in psychology at Temple. Um, so as the title of my talk suggests, today I'm gonna to be sharing some of my own journey and experience in R. And as with any story, um, it helps to start at the beginning. So a little bit about myself. Um, I was born in Argentina to Taiwanese immigrant parents. And when I was 15, traveled to the US to, uh, for boarding school and eventually college and now graduate school. And so naturally a big part of my life and who I am has been navigating and adapting between these three spaces, both culturally, linguistically, um, and physically. Um, and all that is to say that I understand firsthand how difficult it can be to adapt and shift into a foreign space, whether that's a new language or a new culture, et cetera. And it's part of what motivates and inspires me to um, make coding or try to make coding research and data more accessible to others, whether they're high schoolers or undergraduates and out of the lab um, and doing that through by teaching coding in R. So when I start out, uh, one thing I like, one way I like to go about it is through um, data visualization because who doesn't like a pretty image that also tells a story. Um, so I might start out with something that looks scary and daunting, especially to someone that's just starting out, just for making their foray into coding. Um, and as both of these, uh, so the map here shows, you know, COVID boosters per 100 individuals in the population across uh, states in the United States. And um, so uh, above it, you see the code that created it. Both might seem inaccessible, daunting, scary um, to beginners, uh, especially. And so I like to break down the process bit by bit, starting with how to get the data. So, um, so the data that I use to create this visual is publicly accessible. I just literally Googled public vaccination COVID data. And this is one of the search options uh, from the Our World in Data website. Um, so point of this being that these data sets are out there and they're publicly available. Um, and uh, what follows is data sets, these data sets and eventually the visualizations that come with them are within reach to, um, to anybody that can access uh, these web websites. So after you know, downloading the data, um, usually what comes next, as some of you may know, is tidying and cleaning the data. That's actually a big part of it. Um, eventually, essentially molding it and shaping it into what we need um, before plotting. So I haven't actually shown that here, um, both in the interest of time, but also because when I try to you know, teach um, people in the lab or outside of the lab uh, a little bit about R, um, I don't want, the goal isn't to overwhelm them or scare them. Um, the goal is to make it more accessible, make it seem like something that they're familiar with, that they already know, and it's just in a different form. So um, usually I'll just give an overview of data that's a little cleaner, a lot cleaner than, um, than what the raw data we download from the website might be. 
Um, and using function glimpse in this case, um, you get a sense of literally what the data looks like. And again, I draw people's attention to variables. This might not look like standard you know, spreadsheet that people are familiar with, but the variables that you see here are familiar or recognizable. Um, I draw attention to, you know, here region, for example, you say Alabama, so that might be an indication of, you know, the US states. And this long and lat, you know, this looks like longitude, latitude, and, you know, all this data about vaccination rates, et cetera. So all that is to say is um, this is just another way to look at a data table, right? Trying to foster a sense of familiarity um, that then engenders um, accessibility, makes it more accessible. It's something that they already know. It's just in a slightly different form. And then um, you know, I try to jump into what they're excited about, which is making this pretty picture, this pretty map. Um, and again, this might seem overwhelming to a beginner in R especially, um, but usually I like to break it down into all these different layers. So the first layer, you know, all it shows is coordinate plane, just like we might have uh, drawn out, sketched out in our notebooks in middle or high school, drawing the X and Y axes, um, which in this case are longitude and latitude, where we're going to be overlaying our map. And then the next layer, um, again, something that people might be scared about, but really all this is doing is it's filling in this coordinate plane that we've already mapped out with the data that we're interested in that's meaningful to us. In this case, um, the total vaccine boosters per 100 in population and overlaying it with the US map, all these coordinates, right? So um, you could stop here if you wanted to, but at this point, I like to um, try to communicate the again, message of accessibility, just like it was passed on to me, um, trying to emphasize and stress the fact that it's very easy to make an image like this more accessible to someone. So in this case, you know, the shades of blue in this map might be hard for someone with color blindness to see and distinguish the patterns um, across the states. So an easy way to and increase accessibility for this is to just add a few lines of code. Both these lines of code make this map visual much easier to read and therefore more accessible to others. The first one, just uh, using a color palette, grid is that's uh, colorblind friendly. Um, and then this theme void just gets rid of that, uh, that coordinate plane back. Again, making it easier to read helps increase accessibility. Um, and finally, I try to stress and point out that even though the code that I just walked through um, might look fairly polished and clean, um, this is after a lot, lot of trial and error, a lot of mistakes, a lot of, a lot of errors, a lot of trying out solutions, and um, stress that these mistakes and errors and troubleshooting will happen all the time. Um, and this is an iterative process that's, I think, very humbling. Personally, I find it very humbling and a reminder that we're all still learning. Um, and I like to use an example that actually sometimes just happens when I'm trying to um, help you know, undergraduates or um, others learn R, uh, these errors will come up. And so an example of this being, you know, I recently tried to rerun some old code. Um, I just, all this was doing was loading this library, this package, and I ran into this new error that didn't happen last time. I had no idea why it didn't work this time. Um, but and if this were to happen during the actual R session, um, helping people learn, the important thing is to not panic, right? We have, uh, we live in the age of Google. So literally copy pasting the whole error or a part of it into Google search, to begin troubleshooting, which is what I did. And after some trial and error, I found out that essentially I just had to install something to my, um, to my Mac and restart our studio and run my code. And um, that's it. I was able to load my uh, package successfully. And all that is to say and reiterate that this happens all the time, even to people who have been coding for years and years, uh, but it is part of the process, trust the process. And in my opinion, it is an integral part of how we learn. Um, and to quote Bob Ross, we don't make mistakes, we just have happy accidents. Right? All of this is to say that and reiterate that we all make mistakes. Errors will happen and they're happy accidents. Um, we learn through that. 
And with that, I'd just like to thank you all for um, coming to the sign talk and uh, also say I'm really grateful to the R and our ladies community um, for providing the space to learn and grow and also for inspiring me to do the same and pass it forward in my own community. Thank you. All right, thank you, Michelle. I'm gonna do like a, a virtual round of applause, please, for Michelle, that was awesome. Uh, I'd love to open it up to questions. Uh, if people wanna go ahead and type a question in the chat or if you wanna use Slido, and I'd be happy to read them off or uh, let you unmute to ask your question. Got a lot of Bob Ross love. <laughs> okay, let me see the Slido. Okay, I have one question in the Slido for you, which is, do you have any resources for someone else that wants to become a better teacher? I think probably specifically for teaching R. So I don't, I guess, like you, I think I you've mentioned this, Alice, in the um, R Lady Slack channel, but the nice thing about R is there's so many free resources out there. And I think um, looking at like Hadley Wickham, his stuff is super great, um, but also, I've participated in free SciComm, like science communication conferences. And I think it trans a lot of that translates over. It's yeah. just trying to communicate with another person, like connect on a human level um, and trying to apply it to uh, whatever I try to you know, pass along to whoever you know, undergrads in lab, et cetera. Um, it all kind of comes together. Awesome. Okay, we have a few more questions. These are great. Um, Another question was, how can you make data wrangling fun for new learners? Or can you make data wrangling fun for new learners? Um, one thing I like to do is, I mean, a lot of it is like the tone that you set in the, in whatever workshop or session you're doing. And you know, again, like not trying to make people panic or anything. It's fine. Like if we don't, if we run into errors, that's totally okay. Let's just Google it together. But also one approach I like is, um, you know, having a template sort of, uh, and like maybe first I do like I pipe it together and I have mutate and then I have, you know, select, I have other like functions that I've spun together and then having them play around with it and see if you change this part, what happens? Does it break? Why did it break? Um, and I think getting comfortable with making mistakes is also part of that. Um, and trying it out yourself, I think it's really empowering. Great answer. All right, this is um, along the lines of making mistakes and debugging. Um, do you have any suggestions on how to debug? Um, sometimes I Google too much and I lose track of which, um, which things I've tried. Um, I think it's good to have like the history, like the R data, right? That does get saved, I'm pretty sure. Um, but also after a while, like I, I've literally come across like my own post on a thread, which is uh, kind of uh, also very humbling. I'm like, okay, cool, I've come full circle. That's good. Yeah. Um, but I think it's it might seem like you're spending a lot of time doing this, but every time you even go over the same thread, it like kind of stresses the point of like, hey, this is a solution that someone tried. Maybe in the future, I'll be able to use it. Um, and yeah, getting comfortable with that. Awesome. All right. I think we have time for one more question. And this question is, what are some frequently encountered challenges you've come across when teaching R? Um, how do I pick this one? Um, I think like I mentioned uh, earlier, it's just being okay with, like sometimes I'm teaching R and to, to like a group of undergraduates and they're, they're treating it like gospel. They're like, oh, this is like how it's done. And I think the hardest part is, is striking a balance between saying, okay, this is one way to go about doing it, but you, know, you don't have to do it this way. There are a lot of different ways to add your own voice, your own style into it, um, being flexible enough to give them that space so that they can grow and learn. Um, yeah. Awesome. So I wanna thank you again, Michelle. Thank you. Um, great talk, great q and I think thank now you. we're gonna move on to our second speaker. June, are you on and ready to share your slides? Yeah, I'm good. Um, okay, awesome. Yay, share. welcome back, June. If you wanna start pulling up your, 
your slides, I'll do a quick yes. intro. Uh -huh. Awesome. So returning is June. And June is a second year PhD student in linguistics at the University of Pennsylvania. They study language acquisition and human sentence processing. All right, with that, I wanna turn it over to June. Take it away. All right, thank you. Uh, can everyone hear and see the slides okay? Looks they good. Look, they look perfect. All right, this is a quarter, it's my first quarter presentation. I was about so to I hope ask it goes well. You, yeah. <laughs> I was like, this looks familiar. Yes, uh, so Porter showcase too. But yeah, um, I'll be talking about uh, dplyr's, one of dplyr's first slice um, is like actually a very simple function, but it turns out it's very underrated. It can do a lot of cool things that I didn't know were possible. Um, so I'll be walking through um, some of the features that are very under discussed. So um, let's just start with the basics in case you don't know what the slice verb does. It's pretty simple. You basically give it a vector of indices, like in here, one through six, and you say, give me the first six rows of empty cards. So slice basically subs as rows, much like select for columns. Um, there's some other behaviors that, that slice has. So other, like other dplyr verbs like mutate or summarize, uh, you can call functions that are so-called context, context dependent expressions. So if you have the end function, call it without any arguments, it gives you the number of rows that are in a data frame. And so if you pass n to slice, then we'll just select the last row for you. Um, and you can also use that to be like, give me the last couple of rows um, to give me the second to last row through, or the third to last row through the last row. Um, so that's possible. Um, you can also use slice to reorder rows. So depending on the order of the vector of indices, it can give you rows sorted in different orders. So this is one example where we pluck out rows one, three, five, two, and four, six. Um, and just to show you another way of doing it, uh, slice takes what's called like the dot, dot, dots. So the, each element of the vector of indices here can also be supplied as individual arguments, although you probably won't be doing that as often. Um, some other miscellaneous behavior, you can use the minus sign to be like, uh, give me all the rows other than this vector of indices. So this says gives me uh, all rows except the third row to the last row. So it will give you the first and second rows. Um, and you can also say, give me two of the same rows and we'll give you, you know, duplicated rows. Um, and this is just to show you that if you try to select or attempt to select rows that are beyond the range of the number of rows in the data, like give me the, you know, the, the row after the last row that doesn't exist. So it'll just give you an empty data frame. Um, and if you combine that with any other indices, then the slice will just ignore. So give me the first row and the row after the last row the row after the last row doesn't exist, so it only gives you a data frame of the first row of empty cars. Um, so that was just the basics of how dplyr slice works. Um, the point of the, the main focus of uh, today's presentation, though, um, is about dplyr's under discussed, um, underrated feature, which is um, you can use slice much like how you use filter. So we kind of know how filter works, right? It's one of the more common dplyr verbs. Basically, you apply some kind of logical condition like equals 22.8 to a column vector like the MPG vector here. And for filter, um, it takes these kinds of logical vectors that are the same length of the data, right, like here, and then returns you the observations where the expression of value is true. So it was true on, I think, the third observation and then true again on the ninth observation. And so if you pass this entire vector, inside filter, then you get back the third row and the ninth row. And again, with um, you know, all the other dplyr verbs, you can refer to column vectors as if they were variable. So you don't need the empty cars dollar sign. The same thing worked with slice. So you can say, um, you know, this is outside of dplyr, but there's this function called which, which is part of base. And if you apply which to a logical vector, then it will just give you a vector of indices that it values to true. So it gives us just three and nine, which were the true values of the logical vector that we just saw earlier. So we can just pass this to slice and then you get the same functionality as filter. So again, slice like filter, um, you don't need to do empty cars dollar sign to access the MPG column. And then you just have the same logical operator, wrap it in which to convert this into integer indices and then pass it to slice. And this evaluates to slice three, nine. So give me the rows third row and the ninth row. So these are um, just to show you that filter and slice are actually two sides of the same coin because any expression that evaluates to a logical, uh, logical vector um, can be wrapped in which and passed to slice for the same effect. 
um, if you have, you know, a filter one condition, comma, another condition, which is essentially, you know, a conjunct of two conditions, then you can also just, you know, throw that inside slice, but wrap it in wish before you pass it to slice. Um, and same thing with other operators like or. Um, and if you want to go in a really roundabout way, you can be like, give me um, the row numbers that are in the row indexes, and then you can do it inside filter. So that's like a two steps removed process, which is um, not recommended, but you can do that. Uh, so yeah, uh, that's how you can use slice, much like you can use uh, filter for subsetting rows. But why would you ever want to do that when we already have like our handy filter function that we're familiar with? Uh, well, filtering with slice actually gives you two interesting properties that you can work with. One is that slice returns you, or at least slice means that you get to work with vectors of filtered elements. So these are no longer vectors that are always the same length as the number of rows in your data frame. These are a subset of vectors that are oftentimes shorter than your data frame uh, where your condition is true. And the elements of these vectors that pluck out you know, the rows that you want to subset are indexes. So these are integers. So you can do integer operations over indexes. And all of this combined uh, gives you access to these new cool workflows, which I'm going to uh, title like row relational operations and row shuffling. And these are the two that I'll uh, showcase today. I'm, next, I'm actually not sure if I have time for the second one, but it's all on the slides. Okay, so let's start with row relational operations. Like, what does that what does that mean? Well, if you have data that encodes some kind of information in the ordering of rows, so for example, it could be about like time. In this case, this is a data frame about flights from an airport uh, that departed from an airport, uh, and the ordering is in the order of the time that a flight departed. And so the rows are organized in a way that contains information such that a row that comes after another row is, for example, a flight that flies after another flight. So now, given this kind of data frame, we can ask questions about the relationship between row using slice. So here's one question, which flights departed right after the American Airlines flights? So we can answer that with a basic logical operator, like the equals equals sign. So we can say, which of um, the carriers in uh, the carriers call, which values in the carriers column are AA, which is for American Airlines. And then it gives you a bunch of uh, trues and falses. If we want to just pluck out the indices where uh, the value is valued to true, then we can wrap it in which, which gives you the row indices. If we want to ask what are the flights that come right after these flights, you just add it, uh, add one to it, and then this just becomes like uh, your you know usual um, integer vector vector operations, just like mathematical operations. And so you can do that inside slice. So here we want to say uh, uh, from flights df, DF uh, subset the rows where uh, carrier is equal to American American Airlines, but then also it's the one that comes right after it. So then that's as simple as saying which of the rows are the ones where the carrier evaluates to American Airlines uh, and comes right after. So these will subset you rows that come right after um, the American Airlines flights. Um, and then another thing that we can ask is how do we do what we just did of selecting the flights that come right after American Airlines flights, but also select the American Airlines flight at the same time. We just give it two vectors. The vector that is where carrier equals AA and another vector that is carrier equals AA plus one. And then this will give you a little bit longer data frame. But then you realize that if you do it in this order, you get all the American Airlines uh, flights first and then all the other airlines. But we want to keep them uh, arranged in the same order that appeared in the data, or at least the same ordering um, that encodes the same kind of information as the original row ordering. And so to do that, we can uh, wrap this and concatenate into a single vector and then call sort because this is again just an integer index. So we combine these two vectors, we sort them because they're already integers and then we can optionally remove duplicates if we want to with the unique function. And so now we get kind of this interweaving of you know AA flight and then another flight, AA flight and then I guess we have two in a row and then another flight and so on and so forth. Um, Another way that we can do the exact same thing that we just did is using a uh, matrix operation. So um, this is like kind of a, a, a little bit kind of a detour, but works very nicely with slice. So you might be wondering why am I bringing up matrix here? Well, basically we can grab those two vectors of indices. So the indices where carrier equals AA and the indices where carrier equals AA plus one, which represents the rows of these matrices, right? So 
This row is all the AE flights, and this row is all the AE flights plus one. If we want to interweave these two vectors, such that you get 8, 9, 14, 15, 15, 16, 22, 23, and so on and so forth, you simply grab this matrix and then collapse it into a vector. If you call as that vector to a matrix, then it collapses column wise. So it goes, collects all the values in the first column, then the second column, then the third column. And so you get a nicely sorted index that represents multiple vectors being interweaved. And so this is very scalable, right? If you have to do like plus one and plus two, plus three, and so on. Um, and then you can also do the same thing with this base function called outer, um, which I'll just leave this in the slide and you can look over it later. But this is just a faster way of constructing these kind of matrices that are like, you know, multiply or add like this vector by like another multi-length vector, but then they're, you know, lengths don't match and you can't recycle them. But this is like add this vector, right? Add this vector by zero and one and then throw them into rows. And then again, you call as that vector on this matrix, collapses them column-wise, gives you a sorted index. And so if we do it with a little less code than what we just did, then we can use this outer solution and then you get back the same result. Um, and again, I realized this was kind of um, too hurried for a lightning talk, but you can go back and look at it. I think outer is one of the really great base R functions that people don't talk about as much. Okay, um, and then lastly, while we're on the topic of relational operations, uh, let's look at a brief case study of how we might be able to use slice for an actual like data workflow. So I have a data visualization prepared where um, we're using a subset of the Gapminder data set that gives you information about a country or a bunch of countries, their country codes, um, and the, their GDP per capita uh, it, along different years. And so if we wanted to plot, for example, like the GDP of Germany over the years, then that's like pretty straightforward. That's just a bar plot with our information or our data frame after filtering for Germany. But then this seems kind of hard where we would like to plot all the GDP growth of uh, GDPs of Germany over the years, but then also show the GDPs of Germany's GDP neighbors, which are not straightforwardly extractable from column values. So we need to rely on ordering of rows. Um, so here's like a very quick walkthrough of how that works. We basically grab the Gapminder, uh, the subset of the Gapminder data set. We imbue some meaning into row order using group by and arrange such that you get um, a descending or increasing order, I guess, of GDP per capita within each year. And then uh, you do the same trick with slice where you select the you know, countries, uh, when, where you select the rows that um, represent Germany and then grab the one that comes before it itself and then the one that comes after. Uh, and there's this another trick that I often use with the slice trick, uh, which is, uh, using forecast function called uh, factor FCT in order, uh, which also exploits um, this kind of design where there's some kind of inherent meaning to row order. So this says, um, give me a factor factor that has these levels in that order. So Germany is, you know, is Germany. The one that comes right before is lower. The one that comes right before is higher. Um, and if you encode these factor levels this way, then when you eventually go to plot, then the orders are preserved in the ordering of the bars. Um, so this is like, uh, and then you do some other aesthetic stuff and then you get back a plot that looks something like this. Um, so that's like a one concrete case study of how you can use slice. Um, I am running out of time, but really quickly, um, you can also use slice to do um, row shuffling. Um, and so if you have like a vector um, that, you know, has like a bunch of different um, elements where you want to kind of uh, randomly sort them, but make them kind of evenly distributed. Uh, so something that looks more like this, as opposed to this, where like fruits clump together. Um, then you can use that same kind of trick with using a matrix, uh, where you have a matrix representation like this, uh, which corresponds to something like this. And then you collapse column-wise again, which then gives you an evenly distributed uh, vector of different categories. Um, again, if you kind of miss that. That's like here. You, you create a matrix that looks like this, has this representation. You collapse column wise. It collects grape, lemon, apple, grape, lemon, grape, lemon, apple, grape, lemon, so on and so forth, which gives you a nicely distributed uh, vector of the same length. Uh, but then you get that kind of shuffling. And then, of course, this is still working with just like indices, vector indices. And so you can apply it to data frames pretty easily. 
And so we can pass slice a vector of shuffled indices, and then it will give you a data frame whose row order it, uh, evenly distributes uh, uh, levels of a category. Um, and of course, um, you might want to wrap that in a function. So I do have a function in one of my packages uh, that takes a, a factor vector um, and then distributes the rows um, or, or reshuffles the rows so that the levels of the factor are distributed evenly. And yeah, that's it. Uh, thank you. Okay. Awesome. Yay. Round of applause. <laughs> Virtual round of applause. Thank you, June. That was amazing. Um, as always, uh, good visuals. All right. Let's see if we have any, if anyone wants to type any questions in the chat or go ahead over to the Slido uh, with uh, hashtag our ladies. All right. Okay. One question that's in the Slido is, uh, I guess, how did you do the fruit icons? It says maybe fonts. Yes. Um, so that is just uh, embedded straight in the Porto part document. Um, so, uh, yeah, there you go. <laughs> I don't know if you can see that, but they're, okay, they're just wow. in there. Uh, if you're on Windows, if you press um, the Windows key and a dot, it gives you an emoji keyboard. Uh, All right. Cool trick. Um, and so, yeah, you just copy paste them in here. Okay, awesome. Even more emojis for illustrative purposes. <laughs> All right, other questions? Anybody have any questions that they want to type in the Slido or the chat? Yeah, I feel like the emoji programming could become a problem. Like, can you assign a variable, like an emoji as an sure. object? <laughs> While I have it up. This feels like very bad practices. Did it work? To create a style guide. Uh, yeah, maybe it's not going to work. Okay, maybe not. But if you have the right encoding, you can only Yeah, more. yeah. It's like variable <laughs> names. Can they include emojis? Okay, uh, yeah, awesome. Tactics also work. <laughs> okay, people are suggesting now. I will, I will get back it. to you. I'm going to try all these. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'll get back in the chat. Okay, awesome. So if there are no other questions, um, I will ask one more question, which is, yes. um, how did you find using Corto to make the presentation? It looks like you used Reveal JS. Yes, it is um, very neat. Uh, I mean, I was like a big sharing in person before this, and I'm not like off that boat, but it's a like, yeah. cool try. Um, I think it has a lot more options in terms of like organizing code for slides. So if you know like Gina Reynolds like flipbooks uh, package that kind of like extends sharing in um, reveal JS or I guess Porto slides has them kind of embedded in there. Um, there's like a lot more functionality that kind of comes shift with that so you don't have to like play around and like try to make hacks work. Um, which is cool. It has, it has a lot right out of the box. So it was very easy to pick up. A lot easier than sharing them. Okay, awesome. So maybe I'll try it. Maybe I won't. <laughs> awesome. All right. Uh, another round of applause for June. Thank you, June. All right. So now I'm going to queue up Jesse. Jesse, are you on and ready to uh, share your screen? I am on. I will share my screen. Hold on. Awesome. While you are sharing, I will do a bit of an intro. So Jessie uh, is uh, one of our Our Ladies Philly organizers, and she is also the senior manager of a strategic analytics team at Comcast, supporting video engagement and content strategy. Uh, Jessie loves being an analyst in the TV space, automating workflows and using R to build functions, packages, visualizations, and reports. And outside of work, Jessie likes to spend her free time on long walks, listening to podcasts and audiobooks, hiking with her dog, and watching TV. So now I will try not to ask you too many questions about what podcasts and audiobooks you're listening to and what TV shows you're watching. That is a long conversation. Um, <laughs> yeah, as Alice mentioned, I, I work at Comcast in the video space, so I do a lot of work around you know, what are customers viewing, what's important, and I do a lot of visualizations around that kind of work, and 
I've kind of standardized um, several views that we use pretty often um, around just like viewership and different, you know, like views around customers, network stations, things like that, seasonality. And so I kind of had this markdown report that just kept building and building and building. And if anybody's worked on a markdown report that just kind of keeps having something added, another chart, another table, another, um, you know, bit of information, it tends to get a little bit messy. And so I ended up a while ago kind of cleaning it up and doing a like parent child type of structure and really kind of, um, you know, like organizing like functions, organizing the data and kind of building a workflow that allowed me to you know, have like a very isolated piece of code. If something went wrong, I can kind of find exactly where that's going wrong. I don't have to kind of dig through a lot of code. And then what's also nice is that you can build it in a way where you're really utilizing, um, you know, like map functions and things like that to, and, you know, like setting the, using the file directory to kind of set it up in a way where you can, you know, have a couple of scripts and just hit run and, you know, it pulls the data it puts that data into the proper location within the directory, and then you can build a pretty powerful markdown report without ever having to actually, um, um, you know, like manually run many, many files at once. So I'm going to share my screen and kind of just show a very, very basic, sorry, I have too many screens up, a very basic example um, of what this would look like. Hopefully you can see my screen. And yeah, so this is just like the most basic template for a, um, a markdown document. This is an HTML output. So when we run this, basically, I'll show you in a second, it creates a file and um, you know, it's, it, we don't have to necessarily, you don't have to host anything. Um, you don't have to host any data. You can share this very easily, which was a big appeal for me and my stakeholders, especially working with sensitive viewing data. So the way we can, um, I guess, let me sh show an example of what this, the actual output will look like first. Can everybody see around the um, boxes that I have up from Zoom? Yeah. Let me know if that's blocking the screen, okay. No, it looks perfect. Okay, good. So here's like a very basic template for a markdown output. This is an HTML output. You can open this in the browser. And basically this is a document that you can, you know, store, save, you can send it out via email. Um, and you don't necessarily again have to host anything. So it's, it's very easy to share. Most people can open this up in any type of um, browser. And when you combine these tabs with pills, you're able to really kind of create a pretty large document with a lot of information. You can, you know, reference these, um, you know, like um, if you have some descriptives in one section, as it becomes larger and larger, you can reference back to specific areas just to kind of tie those relationships in. You can really kind of do some good storytelling with data using this kind of template. I um, was using PowerPoint for a long time and basically found some limitations with the being able to kind of like tell a good story um, when the PowerPoint is kind of just, you only have the option of going one slide at a time. Whereas with the markdown, you can really kind of navigate and kind of have a little bit more interactive experience when you're presenting. And so basically the way this works is it uses the header system, the markdown header system. So if you have one tab, you know, you can name this anything um, and you start basically at the, you know, one asterisk, uh, one asterisk is each header one in markdown language. And then you add this tab set option and that's what actually will create any, um, anything underneath header one. So as we go to header two, this creates hypothetical tab one, hypothetical tab two, and hypothetical tab three. Again, you could call these anything. And that's what assigns it to um, the tab structure. And so um, 
basically that's what's creating, you know, this tab here, this tab here, and this tab here. We can continue to go down into levels, but basically you can also um, set up the file structure so that, you know, instead of having a bunch of code in this block and just having multiple functions, multiple charts, multiple data pools, you can leverage these, um, the parent-child relationship. So you can do in the, um, the code block here, child equals and whatever the file location is, as long as it's, um, below whatever the working director the directory is here you'll be able to you know set up a lot of options this way so here we have the um folder for the mock-up report this is the r markdown file that we have open currently and then you can create folders with another you know um whatever you want to call you know the type of content that's going to be in this this level create a R markdown file in that level. And basically from here, you can continue to create more tabs, um, continue to um, basically add different depths that you wanna drill into in terms of the information that you're providing. And I'll go to tab, I'll go to tab two real quick. Um, Again, you can store the data specifically to where this R markdown file is. And one of the nice things is that you can have, um, you know, create some sort of package that will run all of the, you know, the process, the workflow and output it directly to the right location. And so you're kind of saving yourself a bunch of work by setting it up in a pretty automated way that way. Um, you can also, I, I like to leverage this, like creating different files for functions, creating different files for um, like very specific parts of the process. And so let me try to show it. So like if you, you know, want to hypothetically create some functions to do some sort of formatting, you can create a separate file, create your, um, you know, formatting file, save these functions. And then instead of having like all of this clutter that accumulates in one document, you're able to just reference something, pull and be able to use it this way. I find that generally, you know, as these documents start to get larger and larger, as they become a little bit cluttered, it can be very difficult to troubleshoot things, to find the thing that you're looking for. Um, and this makes it very easy to just kind of get into the habit of, building something in a way that you can like take pieces of it and you know apply it multiple times instead of like copying pasting the same function over and over again you start to create um this isn't really a package that's another way to go but this is kind of like a um a step where you can just get into the process of keeping everything organized in a way that allows you to reuse certain elements over and over again um, and then again, you can keep adding levels to this. So here we have the, you know, three tabs at the top and then three buttons below it. You can continue to like build this, you know, throughout the document. Um, and as you can imagine, you know, there's not a lot of content in here, but as you start to add different tabs and buttons, um, you know, you can really add a lot of information. And this is a way that I found that it's very easy to send out a lot of data and a lot of visualizations um, to a small group of people via email, having it accessible um, and having them be able to kind of click around and really get a lot of information, again, without having to host data that you know is, is pretty sensitive. Um, I will, pause there for questions. I'm trying to make sure I didn't forget anything. I think those were the, the important things. I guess I'll just show real quick the, the file structure again, just so that you can see how, you know, having functions and data and everything stored, um, you know, within this file structure does keep everything very organized and make it a little bit easier to just reuse parts over and over again without copying and pasting and rewriting things.
All right. Thank you, Jesse. I'm going to do like a, another round of applause for Jesse. Um, I think this is very inspirational. I'm like, I have to reorganize all my projects. Um, I do see we have a question in the Slido, which is basically this, like, do you organize all the scripts and child documents in an R project? I think it's how do you organize all the scripts and child documents? So maybe you kind of showed that, but if you could talk a little bit more about how you organize things. Yeah, and I can show um, maybe um, an example from work without actually like digging into the, um, the actual code, but it, the way that I structure this, so like, like I said, I'm looking a lot of times at like a group of networks together. And so a group of networks, like something like, you know, Warner that's composed of like, you know, 20 something networks, CBS Viacom, like there's, it's these groupings of like a lot of, you know, 15, 20, sometimes over 30 networks all in one company that we need to look at at once. And so what I'm doing is basically using the tabs and pills to the tabs for the most part to set up different like types of, um, you know, in this case, like financial impact, we're looking at a possible drop scenario and predicting what the churn would be in that scenario. We're looking at um, grouping something like seasonality, where we're looking at the seasonality of many networks. And basically under each of these tabs, there will be, um, for example, like a pill for each network. And then sometimes there's another level that will have more detailed information about like, you know, different types of grains, like daily, monthly, um, like um, long-term year-over-year trends, things like that. And so it's just a way to kind of look at, like think about a big project, like think about a big, you know, um, like almost like exploratory analysis, right? Where you wanna have a lot of information, you want somebody to see all the different types of information and out there and thinking about, you know, how do I group things together? And then what are the levels of detail basically that are important to, to show? And so it's a little bit of, you know, just think, I think it depends really on like whatever the, um, like the working problem is, but in general thinking of like high level categories and then ways to split that data into different levels. Awesome, yeah, like in the chat, very modular. Yes, exactly. Um, so I guess there's a question that is similar to this around, maybe you've answered it a little bit, but what are some of the benefits of having the child R markdown files versus putting things in the code chunk? Well, it does tend to get, um, honestly, for me, it can get very difficult to navigate as these things get very, very large. Um, you know, as you can imagine, if you had, you know, for each of these views that tend to contain like sometimes a couple of different views within them, and you multiply that times like 25, you know, individual times, like you can use some map functions and do that within there, but it becomes difficult, especially with the like tab set um, and like basically doing some sort of, like you don't want to physically type all of the levels of every single view necessarily. And this is where if you can do a map function or some sort of like, ideally not a loop, but something like that where you can paste in the levels for, you know, it's not always the same number of networks for me. It's not always the same number of categories. And so this allows me to build it in a way where I can read in the files I guess I can show an example, but read in the files and then for the number of files that are within the folder. So like if you go to like a data folder, um, right? So if you go to a data folder, this just has three networks. This is a relatively small one. Basically what will happen is it will read in the three files and then paste three subheaders that are individual pills and you know create all of the visualizations and tables in that tab and so it allows for flexibility in terms of just finding out how many items there are and then writing the code for you rather than you having to 
keep track of, you know, three, 25, whatever it may be, levels of header for multiple types of content. Awesome, I love that. Okay, final question. Do you have any issues with users being intimidated by an HTML report since they are used to PowerPoint? You know, I had, um, it was a concern. I think at first, I think our stakeholders are used to PowerPoint slides and for a long time, you know, like used to us printing out slides and like showing up at a room with printed out, you know, like a ridiculous, I mean, just so many trees wasted, it's crazy. But there was always, I think, a little bit of concern as well of, are they going to be okay with this? Are they going to, you know, like just want their PowerPoint slides? And from what I found, um, it kind of just happened on accident at first. So there was, you know, COVID back in 2020, and there was just so many urgent requests. And um, honestly, like I kind of got into, had to get into reporting just because we need the like daily information about what's happening. And so, you know, I hate PowerPoint. I hate copying and pasting. I'm really bad at it. I make mistakes all the time doing it. Um, and so I ended up just kind of throwing it into a markdown report and saying like, you know, I set up some automated jobs to kind of run the data, populate everything, and then literally email it out, you know, every morning. Um, and the stakeholders loved it because they found that they could click, they could explore, like it's, it was fun for them to be able to get it that quickly. Um, I wouldn't have been able to honestly just like keep up with it every single day. It was a, you know, recurring type of, of report. And so it made sense and it was pretty well accepted. And I found that generally, you know, even though I think there was some concern at first, like, are they going to know how to open it? Are they going to know what to do with it? And I did have to, you know, like help a couple people, you know, just like, it's not a link. You have to like open it. Um, but once we, I said that like one time to, you know, a handful of folks, they really appreciated the ability to kind of explore and have all access to a lot of information. And I just would not honestly be able to provide that much information if I was having to do it in PowerPoint every time. It's just not a good use of most people's time. Absolutely. Then you have to also be like, open it up and go to slide 95. Yeah. Good luck finding anything important. <laughs> this was so, so useful. Um, yeah, and I think the the other question that is in the slide I was related, which is, you know, how do you share the content when someone does not have R installed? And I think your answer is you can use this, any browser, right? This is the nice thing, honestly, why I like the the HTML outputs a lot is because if the more you get to the more you use it, I feel like you find that it's it's really capable of doing a lot. Again, you don't have to host anything. It's a it's a file that you can share. Anybody can open. You're still able to do a lot of um, like there's a lot of inter interactive elements. Um, there's really endless possibilities. There's widgets that you can add. You can embed shiny um, um, dashboards into a mark HTML markdown report. There's really a lot of options. And I find that, you know, it's, it's really not difficult for people to figure out just how to open it. They might ask you a question once. Um, you can include it in an email. You can include it in, you know, wherever you're, um, storing the file, you can just include some, some instructions, some like a help file, something like that. And I found that it's, it's not difficult for people to open it up and use it. Awesome. I'm, I'm going to take some of these pieces and try to incorporate it into my own reports. Very yeah, cool. I'll try to um, put a little bit of a better um, like example together and share it on GitHub with everyone. That would be awesome. Thanks. Yes. So thank you again, Jesse. Very cool, kind of like a live demo for us. Yes. Thank you. Awesome. All right. So our fourth and final speaker is Kelsey Keith. Kelsey, are you on and ready to share? Yes. I'm good awesome. To go. Okay. If you want to pull up your screen, I will do a quick intro. So Kelsey is a bioinformatics scientist at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, specializing in genomics. And proud to say she's been involved with Our Lady's Day for about three years, and she gave our first virtual talk of the pandemic. So coming back again is great to have Kelsey. All right. Yeah, you didn't scare me away. Yay. <laughs> 
Okay, hi everyone. Um, it's great to talk to you tonight. So, um, unlike the rest of uh, our speakers, I'm actually not going to show you any code. Um, I'm going to walk you through uh, some of the challenges in uh, visualizing genomic data and what we're doing at work uh, to address them. Um, so because this is about my work, I assume everybody on the call is not an expert in biology, so we're going to have a, a little bit of background first. Um, so specifically, I'm going to talk about today visualizing uh, copy number variants. Um, so I think everybody knows that, um, yeah, that everybody knows that, you know, uh, humans have pairs of chromosomes, um, and these are, this is your DNA and it controls everything that your cell does and your body does. Um, so if large, uh, amounts of this DNA is, uh, altered, either duplicated or deleted, this is known as a copy number variant. And I think everybody is probably familiar with some very famous diseases caused by copy number variants. Um, so for example, I probably everyone is familiar with Down syndrome, which is a whole chromosome duplication of chromosome 21. So this is a copy number variant. Um, but more generally, when we have copy number variants, they are, you see like the, um, the orange chunks of DNA. So this is the segment we're considering and say normal people have three copies of that segment. Um, but then sometimes people will gain more than three copies or they'll lose copies and they might only have one copy. So this is a problem because gene, your DNA has dosage, just like drugs have dosage. So you want the dosage to be exactly right. If you uh, lose too many copies or you lose too much DNA, you won't have it do the thing that you need it to do and that's bad. And then if you gain too many copies, that's also bad because it'll do too much of the thing. Um, so this like it can cause genetic diseases, but what I'm concerned with and what I study at CHOP is uh, childhood cancer. Um, so it's very common. So cancer, like most simply, is a disease of overproliferation. Your cells grow too much and they divide too much and there's too many of them. Um, and one of the ways they wind up um, growing too much is because there are these genes that get amplified. Um, so, and they have many, many, many copies. Um, like for example, on this side, I'm showing MCN, which is a very famous cancer gene. Um, and this drives the cells to make many, many copies. So we're interested in um, finding these genes with copy number alterations that are either causing the cancer to grow or maybe something that's been deleted that will put the brakes on the growth. Um, but there are challenges in visualizing genomic data, um, mostly the size and the variability of the data. So size is something we all have challenge. I think most people have challenges with at the moment. Um, so there's like, there's two ways in which size is challenging for genomic data. So like the physical size of the data can be challenging for R to handle or for other programs to handle, um, you know, a, a file can be gigabyte size. Um, and then also it's just the sheer number of measurements, depending on the genomic assay, you could have anywhere from thousands to theoretically billions of measurements per sample, um, because uh, the human genome has about 3 billion, um, uh, you know, bases of DNA, and theoretically you could have a measurement for each of them. So, that's challenging. Um, the other challenge is variability. So um, samples, even within the same person, can vary a lot. Um, like for example, if I would, if someone took a blood sample for me when I was fasting versus you know just or after I'd eaten a meal, there would be differences between them, and those could be those are like legit differences. 
but they're probably not the differences that people are interested in exploring. So there's like technical variability and then there's also like true sample variability. Cancer samples are very different. Um, and even something that's like a strong um, cancer driver will only be present in like a subset of samples. So you need a lot of different views of the samples to try and um, tease out the all of the different uh, possible factors that are influencing whatever your variable of interest is. Okay. So, um, so strategy number one is uh, definitely summarization and scaling. So most of the time we are severely summarizing our data. Um, so this plot is, all of these samples are going to be uh, shown with MCN, uh, which is a, a cancer driver that has is known to have copy number alterations. Um, so what we did was we very highly summarized what are the copy numbers that are present in all of these different cancers. So on the x-axis, you can see all of the names of the cancers. On the y-axis, you can see the copy numbers. So because this is human data, we expect everything to have a copy number of two because like I showed on the first slide, every um, buddy has two copies of each chromosome. So you have one copy of MCN on one chromosome and one copy of MCN on another chromosome. But these are cancer samples. So some of them have deletions. So that's, if you have a copy number of one, that means you have lost a copy and you have a copy number of zero, you've lost both copies or you can gain copies theoretically infinitely. <laughs> um, so you're gonna have three, four, and then this five plus is bent into one group. Um, and you can already see that there are some insights from this, uh, there are some insights from this slide. Um, if you look at neuroblastoma, you can see that there are 77 samples um, with a copy number of five plus, which is very unusual. Um, you can like, even compared to the other cancers, which have one, three, four uh, samples, we can already like figure out, okay, something's going on here. Um, and then another thing we might wanna do is look at the same plot, but in a different scale. Um, so instead of looking at just the counts of samples that have that copy number, we might want to look at the percentages because sometimes the ratio um, can give us more information than just the number alone because the sample sizes for the different diseases are basically based on how common that pediatric cancer is. Um, and like again, you can see in neuroblastoma that the ratio of samples with a high copy number is abnormally high. Um, another strategy we use is further subsetting and combining with other data. So because you know we can see that there's something going on with MCN and neuroblastoma, we might want to um, dial in specifically on that. So the plot on the left is basically um, the same plot is basically the same data from the previous plot shown in a, a stacked bar format instead of in a grid plot. Um, and then this is broken down by the different cohorts in the data. There's two different um, groups that these samples come from, and then it's shown combined in the all uh, cohort. Um, and then what the plot on the right is, is this is what's bringing in other data. So MCN is a gene and um, we can look at how strongly that gene is acting um, in another set of data. Um, and then we can bin that by the copy number. So um, I can say a transcript per million of 500 is a very high number. Um, so we can see there's very high expression and we can see in the um, yellow box plots, um, which are like the five plus copy number that it is 
really increasing the activity of that gene, which is bad because this is what's driving these cancer samples. Okay. And then the last solution is to try and actually visualize the entire genome. Um, so this is a super complicated plot. So we're gonna go through it um, ring by ring. Uh, so this is known as a circus plot. Um, and so the outermost ring is the genome. So you can see going around it, like chromosome one to 22 for humans and then X and Y. Um, so that's just orienting you like where you are in the genome, like the same as the map of America from earlier. Um, the next ring is the copy number, which we've been looking at in all of the other plots. Um, and this is colored exactly the same way as all of the other plots are. And you can actually see there is a big yellow spike of chromosome 22. And that's MCN, which we've been looking at because it has um, even though the axis isn't plotted because it would be really tiny on the y axis of that ring is the actual number of copies and there is some kids who have like 600 copies of it, which is absolutely insane. Because um, they're supposed to have two. Um, so this is this next string is basically the same as the box plots on the previous slide is the correlation between copy number and gene activity, um, but instead of just for a single gene, it's for every gene in the genome. Um, so purple is higher activity and green is lower activity. Um, and then this blue ring marks the location of genes that we already know are relevant in cancer. Um, and then this is, last one is the connections between relevant genes. So now like looking at this whole um, genome my picture, we can see that the strongest signal is from our MCN gene and that it's a known cancer gene, that it causes an increase in gene activity. And that it's also linked to other known um, cancer genes that, uh, uh, that may also be contributing to the cancer formation in these kids. Um, yeah, so I hope that was interesting for people and they learned a little bit about uh, how the human genome worked. Uh, you know, and if anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you, Kelsey. First of all, virtual round of applause for Kelsey. Thank you so much. All right, let's see. Looks like we have a question in the Slido. Okay, this sounds like it's mm -hmm. relating to one of your plots. What is the gene view plot with the colored squares called? What gene oh, okay. is that? That this is geom tile. Yeah. Geom tile. Okay, awesome. And then yeah, people are commenting. Really cool visuals. And I, I put a question in the chat. What is this mm -hmm. color palette? It's very nice. This is Veritas. Okay. Um, so I Looks can great. drop a link in the chat. So like this color palette is the best. Um, it was actually somebody's like PhD thesis and they developed a colorblind and uniformly consistent, um, and how do they put it? Like perceptually consistent color thing, color maps. Cause you know, like the default, like ggplot continuous color scale is the worst. And you know, like in the middle, you can't actually blue, tell if right? things are different. Yeah. It's just blue. Like yeah. no one should use it. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, someone asks, is this Virtus? And yeah, Michelle, it's Virtus. Um, yeah, so like these are designed to be, so you can tell like the difference between like the same distance all the way through the color scale, which you don't really think about until you look at this. And then you're like, oh wait, yeah, actually so many of these color scales are bad. Okay, awesome. And then my second question yeah. was, do you hard code the text colors? Cause like it's white on the dark ones and then like black on the light ones, you know, like here, like 40 is, yeah, white I, is black. Yeah, I like um, colored the, I set the 
yes, I like scaled the col text color manually because okay, I was really hoping somebody yeah. has that figured out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's just like basically I set like the block color to like the copy number. And then I also set the text color to the copy number. And because one's fill and one's color, you can use a uh, set color manual to set the text color manual because there is like I tried to put it on a continuous scale and there's like nothing you can't use one text color like there's nothing that shows up on the yellow and the purple got it the attempts were made it sounds like <laughs> all right we have a couple other questions that came in on the slido so um here's a question what is the target audience for these plots Okay, so the target audience for these plots is uh, like physician clinicians, probably more like physicians who do research as well. Um, theoretically, these are supposed to be going up eventually um, as part of an NIH funded project on a website where they'll be publicly available. Awesome. I, I have no idea when that's going to be because this is going to be in the second round and the first round hasn't even gone up yet um so yeah um okay. and then the the secondary audience would be like uh, pediatric cancer researchers excellent and i think this question yeah. follows on that which is like how are those research then researchers then using these um or how are insights generated from these visuals used to drive research um the big question yeah it is a big question. Um, yeah. So I think these are going to be, um, so like in addition to these, there will also be table, like tables made available to download as well as like the complete um, data that like underlies these visuals, which for like people don't know, like this is like these samples have like complete genome sequencing. So like that will also be made available to researchers. Um, but I think what happens is like people already have some sort of research they're interested in and they come to the website and they're like, okay, well, like what gene is associated with my gene or if I'm looking at my gene, am I correct that this is like altered in um, these kids or perhaps like I know that, you know, this is altered, gene is altered in neuroblastoma but I didn't realize that it was actually deleted in osteosarcoma. That's interesting. Like, um, you know, that's the opposite of what I expect. I, the problem with this is like, once you get started asking questions, there's like an infinite number of questions you can answer. Yeah. So I, I basically anything under the sun. Awesome. All right. Well, it sounds like it's very impactful. And so thank you. Thank you for sharing with us. All right, so with that, that's our final talk of this year's Lightning Talk session. I want to rethink all the speakers again. Thank you for your wonderful talks. I learned something from all of them, which is like my dream <laughs> coming to these. Um, yeah, and so with that, I think thank you everybody for coming. As mentioned, we'll be posting this on our YouTube and we will try to make all those uh, links to the materials that have been shared and everything available as well so that people can find them and follow up. Um, so with that, thank you everyone. I'm gonna close the call and hopefully I will see you all on Slack and at our next event. Feel free to reach out. You can also email us at philly at ourladies.org if you wanna volunteer. Thanks, bye everyone. <laughs>